this next program, we will be investigating missing sounds. And for the very first time, we will be working together with um, sign language interpreters, um, which you can see, uh, you know, live in action uh, currently next to me. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you poet Raymond Antrobus and Kila van der who will be talking about the fascinating subject of missing sounds. Welcome everyone at home, uh, welcome here in the room, this program with uh, Raymond Antrobus. Um, Raymond was born in Hackney, London, to an English mother and a Jamaican father. He is the author of To Sweeten Bitter and The Perseverance. Um, he is one of the world's first recipients of a master's degree in spoken word education from Goldsmiths, University of London. He is the founding member of Chill Pill, and the Keats House Poets Forum. He has had multiple residencies in deaf and hearing schools around London, and he won the uh, Rathbone Folio Prize and the Ted Hughes Award, Award, among other prizes. Last year, he published a children's book called Can Bears Ski? And this year, his new book will be published, All the Names Given. Welcome, Raymond. Thank you. Um, can I ask you to uh, open this program by performing your poem, Echo? Sure. Um, so Echo is the opening poem from uh, the book, The Perseverance. And just one context I'll give to this poem um, is it's the first poem I wrote when my father passed away. And um, I went to Barcelona. I went to Gaudi's Cathedral. And I had the um, Bluetooth um, synced with my hearing aids um, so I could access the, the tour audio guide um, when I was in Gaudi's Cathedral. And there was a part of the tour where it said that Gaudi believed um, that there were certain shapes that the roof has is, uh, the, is thought of as the the holy container of sound, perfect encapsulation of sound in the sense that the way in which you experience sound is like an angel and you will be elevated through this experience. And I wondered about that and if deaf people, if we are included in this idea of the elevation of sound. And that was a question I think you know, every book you write will often have a question at its core. And I feel like that was the question that kind of ran through the whole book and not just a poem. Echo. My ear amps whistle as if singing to Echo, goddess of noise. The raveled knot of tongues, of blaring birds, consonant crumbs, of dull doorbells, sounds swamped in my misty hearing aid tubes. Gaudi believed in holy sound and built a cathedral to contain it, pulling hearing men from their knees as though deafness was a kind of atheism. Who would turn down God? Even though I have not heard the golden decibel of angels, I have been living in a noiseless palace with a doorbell as pulsating light, and I am able to answer. Two. What? A word that keeps looking in mirrors in love with its own volume. What? I am a one-word question, a one-man patience test. What? What language would we speak without ears? What? Is paradise a world where I hear everything? What? How will my brain know what to hold if it has too many arms? Three. The day I clear out my dead father's flat, I throw away boxes of molding LPs. Garvey, Malcolm X, Mandela, speeches on vinyl. I find a TDK cassette tape on the shelf. The smudge green label reads Raymond speaking. I play the tape in his vintage cassette player and hear my two-year-old voice chanting my name, Antrop, and dad's laughter crackling in the background, not knowing I couldn't hear the word bus and wouldn't until I got my hearing aids. Now I sit here listening to the space of deafness. Antrop. 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 Four. And if you don't catch nothing, then something wrong with your ears. They've been tuned to the wrong frequency. 
So maybe I belong to the universe underwater, where all songs are smeared wailings for Celestia, goddess of salt water, healer of infected ears, which is what the doctor thought I had since deafness did not run in the class in the in the family, but came from nowhere. So they syringed oil, olive oil and salt water, and we all waited to see what would come out. Five. And no one knew what I was missing until a doctor gave me a handful of Lego and said to put a brick on the table every time I heard a sound. After the test, I still held enough bricks in my hand to build a house and call it my sanctuary, call it the reason I sat in saintly silence during my grandfather's sermons where he preached the good news I only heard as Babylon's babbling echoes. Thank you so much, Raymond. Thank you. I've been looking forward to this program because I've been watching so many of your videos, your poetry performances, reading your work, and now here we are finally in Rotterdam. I started following you on Instagram and I saw when you were traveling over here to Rotterdam, <laughs> you were so excited and you were like, this is the first poetry festival I'm visiting or attending and performing at in one and a half years. How is it for you to be here now? Oh, great. Um, a blessing. It's... Uh, it's, it's, it's simultaneously a return to normal, I suppose, in, in, in a way. Um, but it's also a, you know, a new experience. I've never been here before, never been to Rotterdam before. Um, and I didn't read much about the place. I wanted to kind of just come and explore and, and, and just see it firsthand. And I'm glad I did it that way because it it's given me little surprises so far. You know, the parks are beautiful. And um, be, I didn't know it was like by the river and the dock and everything you've got here that's around here. So, you know, I'm still just <laughs> letting it kind of wash over Taking me as well. Taking it all in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're from London, from Hackney, the one part, a neighbourhood in London. How does London compare to Rotterdam? Like what kind of region is Hackney? Um, so yeah, so Hackney is a very particular part of London that I claim and talk about because I feel like it's the truest th um, part of my identity or the purest part of my identity because Hackney historically is such an interesting place. Like th there are street names there named after so many mainly socialist uh, writers and thinkers and you know, Sojourney Truth and Nelson Mandela House. Um, and then you have all this history, all these people that have been to Hackney. Um, James Baldwin came to Hackney and then Muhammad Ali came to Hackney. Nelson Mandela's been to Hackney. Like, so it's just such I feel a, I should go there. I yeah, I should visit I mean, that place. Sure. But but it's uh, it's different now. It's also uh, the other part of it is that it's a place that's become very gentrified. And when I was growing up, it was one of the poorest parts of the country. And now it's uh, fright. And you know, and there are good things and and bad things I think about the gentrification of it. Um, so nowadays, when I say I'm from Hackney, it almost m people often f are thinking of a different place. And um, which is why people that have like born bred in Hackney for, throughout the you know 80s, they they some of them would call it Crackney rather than Hackney. So <laughs> it's like a way you know again it's interesting a piece of yeah. language and our ideas of identity and what a, what a place is and what it is to us. And what has that place meant for your poetry? Um, well, there's a there's a I can't remember if I heard someone say this or if I came up with it. So I, I don't know, but I, there's a, it's a piece of language that sticks with me, which is poetry is music from the place you were born. And th the music that's in me uh, through language, through poetry is very much of Hackney. It's Hackney, it's very much of that landscape. <clears throat> and I think leaning into that and understanding that for myself as a writer has really helped me to have a kind of vision, to kind of ground me and to keep me writing, 
you know, so no matter where I go, it's like, well, this is this is still a ground to stand on. Um, and, you know, and, and it's interesting because I think also being older now and having lived in other places, like I've lived in, I've lived in South Africa and different parts of the States, and um, that's helped me understand how, a pla how places change, people move, um, and that's, that's just life, and that's, that's okay, you know. So, so being from Hackney, being from London is a big part of your identity, which we can also find in your books. Another interesting part of your identity, which you write about a lot, is you being uh, Jamaican Britain, British, mm. or British Jamaican. Mm. Um, how did that play a role in your process of becoming a poet, being a poet? Yeah, so I think, I think it's something that I've been careful of now as I've gotten older. Because I don't want to kind of overclaim being Jamaican or overclaim being British, but in poetry, I bring those, I fuse them both together because they really are kind of um, catalysts to the, the the poet I am and the and the things that and the concerns I have, you know, as a, as a writer, as a poet, um, and so even how my dad loved poetry and he would talk about poetry and, and you know what is one of his tapes here mm -hmm. um, and he would record a poem maybe off like the BBC World Service or something he would hear maybe uh, a Jamaican poet Miss Lou or Linton Kwesi Johnson and record it and then play it to me and then he would recite it and you know um, Miss Lou has a poem called Colonization in Reverse and, um, you know, I just remember this one bit. Uh, what a devil might a damn England then raise war and curse the worst, but then wondering how we're going to stand colonization in reverse. And it's just kind of a very cathartic poem, very, uh, despite its kind of political um, uh, um, power that's in it is also a kind of satirical mm -hmm. kind of imagining of what's going to happen when we colonize England, when Jamaicans come <laughs> over and, you know, and, and there was, so there was this kind of uh, joy in that. And then my mom, who loved William Blake, and we talk about William Blake all mm -hmm. the time, and I had a poster of um, the poem London by William Blake on my wall um, next to a poem called The, uh, the Song of the Banana Man. Um, by another another po uh, Jamaican poet um, called Ivan Jones, and so it was just kind of part of it. And and you know, the fact that I had these two parents who themselves weren't poets or aren't poets, and yet felt some kind of kinship mm -hmm. with it enough to talk about it with me and share it with me. Um, and they're both talking about poets from the places where they're born. British poets, English poets, Jamaican poets, Caribbean poets. So I never felt like poetry wasn't something that I couldn't do. It was that, you know, so by the time I got to school, which is when the majority of people in the UK first experienced poetry, and that first poetry lesson might be we're going to look at an ambit pentameter about Shakespeare. Right. Uh, I love Shakespeare. No disrespect to the ambit pentameter, but <laughs> I, I would argue that it's not the best place to start. And I would also argue that poetry isn't about right and, you know, getting something right or getting something wrong. It's about wonder. It's about questions. It's about, um, it's about music, like I say. It, so because I think many people associate poetry with this, with, the, with uh, no disrespect to the English teachers, but with some bad English lessons. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's, you know, there, there's uh, lots of reasons for that, which aren't directly the teacher's fault. So, yeah. you know, I kind of feel I got lucky. So one of the most beautiful poems, I think, in The Perseverance uh, about this part of your identity, which we could call like double identity or mixed or hyphenated identity, uh, is the poem Jamaican British. Mm. Would you maybe like to recite maybe the first four lines of that poem? Sure. Um, 
Some people would deny that I'm Jamaican British. Nose Angelo hair straight, no way I'm Jamaican British. They think I say I'm black when I say I'm Jamaican British, but the English kids at school made me choose Jamaican British. That's the first. I love that so much. Yeah. I read that that poem is often used at schools now. Yeah, it's on the GCSE curriculum. Yeah. It's taught in school. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. What do you think about that? Um, I feel... I feel honoured and sceptical. <laughs> Why sceptical? Sceptical because, like I said, poetry in the classroom, mm. you know, I hope, I hope it's not being taught in this kind of polemic way mm. in which there's a right and there's a wrong. When the whole kind of ex species of the poem is saying basically... It, you can be more than one thing. More than one thing about you can be true is ultimately what the poem's about. Yeah. And if it's, you know, didactically taught, where it's only about, you know, it's a, it's a poetry form, it's a gazelle, an ancient Iranian form, but also Jay-Z has a, couple, a rap verse where he kind mm -hmm. of uses a, sim a very similar... And so I actually uh, use those two, ver like a Jay-Z verse and this ancient Iranian gazelle uh, poetry form uh, to unlock the music of that. And there's also a poet, uh, a poet called Aaron Samuels who has a version of, of the poem. So it's, it's a poem that's very much in conversation with, you know, in a way, capital L literature mm. and capital L living life. Yeah, yeah. So my, you know, I hope it can be modeled in that way but ultimately like anything a book a poem once you've written it and you give it away it, it's not yours anymore it's not mine mm -hmm. that poem is not mine anymore i don't feel a, a real sense of ownership over it it's living its life yeah it's yeah. living its life and that's where it's ended up i think my favorite <laughs> um kind of genesis of that poem is the fact that i wrote it while I was working as a teacher, specifically for these 14 and 15 year old boys who wouldn't sit still at cl in, in, in lessons. And we had them taken out and just uh, we were like, okay, we'll just put these four boys in this is one lesson on their, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll do these English lessons and these poetry lessons kind of in isolation. And it was tr tricky at first, but we did an experiment because we were looking at um, the ways to model learning. Mm -hmm. And we were like, okay, you know what? Let's just stop trying so hard. So why don't we, me and this other teacher, uh, Mr. Foley, we, would, we did this thing of sitting at the lesson. So every, every time I came into the lesson, we would already have our head down writing. So they'd just seen us doing this. And they sat down and we would wait for them to calm and then we'd wait for them to ask, what are you doing? What are you writing? And then we'd go, oh, poems. Oh, okay, cool. All right. So <laughs> we struck up a bargain where it was like, if we wrote a poem for these, for the, for these students, yeah. um, they would give us in return 20 minutes of silent <laughs> writing. And it worked. It was so, in <laughs> so interesting. And out of that, or out of those 20 minutes silent writing exercises, it was like, oh God, I've got to write a poem before the end of the <laughs> lesson, came that poem, Jamaican Can British. I borrow this idea with my students? Absolutely, it's yours, have it, have it. It's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another thing you do a lot is make wonderful, powerful poetry videos. And... Um, I propose that we'll watch one now, right now. It's one of your poems, Dear Hearing World. So the poem and the voice that we will be hearing is from you. Um, the video was directed by Adam Docker, mm -hmm. and the performer who we'll be seeing is Vilma Jackson. Dear Hearing World. in search of sound or orbit. A solar system where the space between a star and a planet isn't empty. I've left Earth in search of an audible God. 
I do not trust the sound of yours. You would not recognize my grandmother's hallelujah if she had to sign it. You would have made her sit on her hand. Put a ruler in her mouth as if measuring her distance from holy. Take your god back. Though his songs are beautiful, they are not loud enough. Lazarus. For every deaf school you've closed, every deaf child whose confidence has gone to a silent grave, every BSL user who has seen the annihilation of their language, I want these ghosts to ward your tongue-tied hands. I have left Earth. I am equal parts sick of your own. I'm hard of hearing too. Just because you've been on an aeroplane or suffered head colds, your voice has always been the loudest sound in a room. I call you out for refusing to acknowledge sign language in classrooms, for assessing deaf students and what they can't say instead of what they can. They did not ask to be part of the hearing world. I can't hear my joints crack, but I can feel them. I am sick of sounding out your rules. You tell me I breathe too loud, and it is rude to make noise when I eat. Sent me to speech therapists, said I was speaking a language of holes. I was pronouncing what I heard, but your judgment made all my syllables disappear. Your magic master trick here in world. Drowning out the quiet. Bursting all speech bubbles in my graphic childhood. You are glad to benefit from audio supremacy. I tried hearing people, I tried to love you, but you laughed at my deaf grammar. I used commas, not full stops, because everything I said kept running away. I mulled over long paragraphs because I didn't know what a natural break sounded like. You erased what could have always been poetry. Strike that out, you erased what could have always been poetry. Taught me I was inferior to standard English expression. I was a broken speaker. You were never a broken interpreter. Taught me my speech was dry for someone who just sound like the underwater. And it took years to talk with a straight spine. A mute red mask on the coursework you assigned. go missing like sound in space and I have left earth to find them I've watched that video several times, mm -hmm. and it just gives me goosebumps every time. It's so powerful. So what we see Vilma Jones doing is performing your poetry in British s sign language. And as you write about in your poems themselves, that language has a different grammar slightly than the British language. Mm. Could you tell us something about those differences? I mean, yeah. Um, so one of the kind of main syntaxical differences is you begin sentences with an object so you know table sit at mm -hmm. is like a grammatical kind of uh, structure of in bsl um well i should say i'm not an authority on bsl um when i was at school even though i learned it i've used more SSE uh, sign supported English. Mm -hmm. So I would be signing in English grammar structure while I was right. uh, signing and speaking. And signing and speaking is a very difficult thing to do. Some people do it well, I do not. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just, I just want to be kind of clarify myself as a mm -hmm. non specialist. <coughs> so you also write about the time tenses, right? 
the so everything being in the present oh yes yeah so even this is like a, a thing that some people have contended m m me for saying but i stand by it because in a in a the way that in an english sentence you would have you know a tense um a past tense or mm. present tense you wouldn't have that in sign but you will you would begin a sentence by saying i mean it could be before right and then then and then but it's still i still st stick by um the tenses not being um woven in and understood in the same way mm -hmm. that they are in the english language um so that yeah that's that's another um i suppose way to look at how the mentality and uh and it, like, like you say it's th the sense of time can be different yeah. in a different language and in the f and in, in a physical language mm -hmm. as well yeah so in your books in the yeah. perseverance you um included some drawings as well mm. so drawings of signs i suppose mm -hmm. um why did you do that why did you find that important so the book uh, the perseverance in particular is I wanted to, this is a book I wanted to write for a long time and the thing that kept coming up for me was how do I, how do I write about sign and spoken language and my experiences going through like the deaf education and a hearing education um, as someone who's aware of deaf history and is aware of the oppression of the uh, what they call the oral method, the talking, speaking, speech method, uh, is aware of the oppression of that world on the deaf world. And yet, yes, uh, I'm a poet who, who, who is deaf and has been educated in this way, but I write in English. I'm an English language poet. Mm -hmm. How do I present all of these things in one, one poem or one book? Um, the illustrations were a way for me to, for for a sign to take up space, and um, I'd, I'm friends with a few deaf poets as well, who who I also felt uh, affirmed me in that decision. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Meg Day, Ilya Kaminsky um, are two poets who also use uh, sign in some of their poems or have used. Yeah. Um, so they're also a way for, as, as for the readers, I think, they're also a way f to make space for a breath. Mm -hmm. um, it makes space, it punctuates its own kind of uh, space um, between some of the poems. Um, and so there was a kind of instinctive feeling about putting these poems in as well like, uh, putting those illustrations in as well i don't think the book would be complete without that so even the way that each poem which is a sequence uses a bsl hand sign um and even looking at today i think and uh, looking at even um asl and quite a few other you know even spanish sign language they they, they count differently mm -hmm. so, so even having the numbers in the bsl uh, oh, for um, shape, hand shape, is a way to mark, you know, a language yeah. which is which has its history and has its um, presence in in a, in a place. Yeah. So you call yourself an investigator of missing sounds, yeah. which is also the name that we gave this program. Yeah. What do you mean by that? I think that what you what I was saying about poetry being this place that you can go to if you think of poetry as a country and it, as a citizen of uh, or as a in the country of poetry nothing has to be an absolute nothing really is achieves its greatest potential if it has one idea so this is an absolute truth um so the investigation is 
you know, it uh, implies the investigation of the self, mm -hmm. but then the investigation of the world that we're living in, the investigation of our language. Um, it's a way to playfully say or welcome the idea of investigation into the lives that we're living. And the missing sounds is for me, obviously in one level it's about deafness and all of, all of the kind of ways that um, I've had to adapt and you know I've learned sign and and, uh, and uh, lit reading and all of this kind of stuff but there's 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 also we are generally as people in our countries we are greatly greatly miseducated and so that the, the missing sounds are about the things in which you know maybe questioning or investigating more f ways in which we are conditioned into the ideas that we have. And because um, it's, 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 it's tricky, we have to, we ha we have to be vigilant of, of, of that, of, of any of our beliefs, of any, anything that we, we're like, this is, this is true, this is absolutely true. It's like, okay, well, poetry as a practice, I've realized can only happen for me if I hold what I think lightly, I always need some flexibility to, to, to really write into it. So, you know, there's some, those are some of the ideas that I was coming at with, you know, investigation of mm -hmm. missing sounds, yeah. Would you say poetry has an important position in the deaf community? In the deaf community, ooh, um, I think poetry, ought to have an important presence anywhere where language is integral to that community. And I, I think deaf communities are particularly grounded by language, sign language, but so are really any marginalized language will have its, you know, is a, again, a way of a certain, an, an identity, a, a, a place to belong in that language. Um, so, I mean, yeah, again, it's just a kind of a, a welcoming, because one of the other things that was tricky about, or some of the hurdles I had in my mind about writing a book like The Perseverance was, um, you know, there were people who, people who I've gone to school with who don't think um, that, don't think that um, deaf, deaf people should, should use the oral language at all. They should mm -hmm. uh, not, not, not use that and because, it, because of the oppression and the baggage that comes with that and that they only want to sign and that people should only be learning sign. Um, and then there's the, the other extreme of, let's say people shouldn't learn any sign language. It limits deaf people. It's a marginalized language. They won't get any good jobs. And, and I think both of those camps are operating solely on trauma and pain. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, is, is again, often, in the middle of these two things. So, so I advocate for, for, for sign and for speech, uh, you know, because it's also because it's something that works for me. I, I'm still able to uh, be a deaf person in a hearing world with, you know, with the, so, it, so, so again, I'm not, is I'm not what I'm saying isn't like an absolute. Mm -hmm. I'm to, I, so that that's my kind of personal uh, way of being. <laughs> but when you have different sides of a fence, it you know you're often trying to see something between the, the divide. And 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 it's interesting to me that actually the root of that conversation is language. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's tricky. I'm not. Sh I don't. I haven't done much research about 
um, Dutch sign language. I'd be interested to speak about that and learn about that and know about the Dutch um, deaf communities. Um, because uh, for the past few years since writing this book, I've been to Jamaica, I've met deaf people in Jamaica and in Trinidad and in Ukraine. Um, and all of those places, one of the most constant things that I hear is the relationship between illiteracy um, mm. and, de and deafness. Um, so in Jamaica, they have a 95% illiteracy rate uh, in the deaf community. Uh, in the UK, they reckon it's around 70%. Um, but, but even the, that statistic is complicated because there's another piece of language in which they call functionally literate, mm -hmm. which means they, if you were to assess them by um, standardized English, then it would, would fail. But these are people that still function in the hearing world and they can still write in a way um, that gets them by. But again, it, you see, it's, it's complicated. Yeah. Um, and some of those statistics are included in yes, your poetry, yeah, interestingly exactly, yeah. enough. Yeah. yeah. Talk about learning. I've learned so much from you, like your work, your videos, your interviews. Um, one of the many things you taught me is the difference between uh, the spelling of the word deaf or deafness mm. with a capital D and a small d. Could you shortly explain that difference? Um, yeah, so small d deaf is mainly about someone who's medically deaf, who only has a medical understanding of their deafness. Um, and often those, pe those will be people who became deafened later in life, so a late deafened m person. And um, capital D deaf is someone who is culturally deaf, someone who is proud um, of the community that they're from and take great pride in, their, in the language that they speak. Um, and so they have like a cultural awareness and a cultural way of being deaf. Yep. And yeah, that's the main thing. And you use both forms in your poetry. Yeah. So once I'd learned that, I was like, oh, interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a way in. Yeah, yeah it it, it, you got it. It's become a form. It's a kind yeah. of deaf poetic as, as, as a way of being. So every book I write has three versions. It has the printed version. Uh, it will have an audio version. And then it will have the performed version. And all of them have s slight different textures and nuances. So... Raymond, may I invite you to perform some more poems for us sure. today? Um, maybe uh, Two Guns in the Sky for Daniel Harris. Okay. Two Guns in the Sky for Daniel Harris. When Daniel Harris stepped out of his car, the police officer was waiting gun raised. I use the past tense, though this is irrelevant in Daniel's language, which is sign. Sign has no future or past tense. It is a present language. You are never more present than when a gun is pointed at you. What language says this if not sign? But the police officer saw hands waving in the air, fired, and Daniel dropped his hands, his chest bleeding out into the concrete meters from his home. And I'm in New York coffee house reading this news on my phone when a black policewoman walks in, two guns on her hips, my friend next to me reading the comment section, Black Lives Matter. Now what could we sign or say out loud when the last word I learned in American Sign Language was alive? Alive. Both thumbs pointing at your lower abdominal. Index fingers pointing up like two guns in the sky. Thank you. So here many aspects that we've been talking about are, are coming together. Maybe we could say like intersectionality mm -hmm. is a theme in this poem. So how would you say that 
Black Lives Matter, the movement of thinking about all those themes connected to violence comes together with being deaf and the deaf community? I mean, yeah, the main connection is just... I mean, you, you, you said it there about intersectionality, but these are um, oppressed groups and um, each of them, again, are, seem so isolated. But the thing that we know when we study history is, is in our language that like the British mastered this. You know, they called it divide and rule. People know how dangerous it is when you align your movement, your your pain, your need for justice for who you are and, and the people you love. It's a hell of a thing. I mean, you change the world when you align that, but. You separate it and you, you dilute and kind of condescend and, uh, you know, the, then the, the power is lost. It's a bit like, oh, it's just, why did this analogy come to me? Did you ever have Captain Planet as a... Uh, there was a, chil a children's TV? TV show called Captain Planet. I'm not sure. I can see one person shaking, <laughs> saying yes. Well, it had a theme song. I remember it was actually like an eco justice cartoon. Really? So it's like Captain Planet, he's a hero, gonna bring pollution down to zero. Captain oh Planet, goodness. amazing. But the way in which you summon Captain Planet is you use all the powers of different seasons. So these mm. people would come together, and they would. You know, they have these rings. It's like wind, fire, like all the elements. I have to see this. They come together. I mean, there's some show from like the late 80s, early like 90s. And that to me is a great analogy for the power of and the importance of intersectionality. Mm. Because in each of these shows, they're not just fighting. Like the bad guys are always like, I'm going to cut down all the trees in the woods. <laughs> or like... I'm going to build a bank and destroy all these small communities and I'm going to be very rich and everyone is going to be very sad and then Captain Planet will be summoned and he would... But it's the fact that Captain Planet only exists because of these other elements, because of this shared understanding of injustice. It's beautiful. I've only just come up with this. I love it. It's such a you. big name. Like Captain Planet is Captain Planet. everything. It's, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so I also asked you, and I'll ask you again, to read the poem and that. Okay. Because I'm so curious to the performance, because I've only read it uh, on paper. Okay. Um, so, and that. Which is uh, a poem I wrote... Um, after seeing a childhood friend in Dalston. I'll just find the page. Yeah. <coughs> Chicken wins and that. Boss man, salting them and that. Don't assault man, give man a napkin. Big man, no steroid and that. Dark times, new street lights and that. How's man? I'm getting by and that. Still, boy, them harass. Not beefing, not tag man, still trap. Cycle man, pedaling and that. On road, new pavements, leveled and that. Crack need change, still stay dwelling and that. Paradise moves, but I got to land grab. We E8, East man, ain't got to adapt. Our kingdom. Got no land to hand back. Man chat breeze, chat trade winds and that. You out end, got good job, legit and that. Locked off man them, stay plotting and that. Raw ray, flower shorts, you hipster and that. Man gone, vegan, no chicken wins and that. So, so what is this language, the rhythm, the sound that we're listening to in this poem? What is that exactly? That is uh, 
that's, as you'd say, that's like someone from the ends, someone who's like never left, someone who's only exists in this one place. And um, I literally hadn't seen him for like since we were at school. So just visually, he looked at me and was like, you're from here and you're not from here at the same time. It, it, it's, it was interesting. Um, and the language of that, you know, like I say, you know, poetry is music from the place you were born. And some people could say that there's like a grime rhythm mm -hmm. to it. Um, and that's true because that's poetry, you know. Um, and it's, yeah, just kind of tapping in. So like every place that you go will have its own frequency and that's why when you arrive for me when I arrive in a place it, I need to be in a place for a significant amount of time to tap into the frequency of it and the frequency isn't just the weather it's not just how the wind is blowing it's how people talk it's how people interact it's how people see each other identify each other and that in between that is something really powerful and beautiful and again where poetry comes from um so i i was i was apprehensive about putting that poem in a book cuz i didn't want it to be like i'm mocking him mm -hmm. but actually he's mocking me so it's kind of like no oh, i i can do this cuz this is this is true, and the fact that I'm hesitant about it can be a good thing. It can also mean, oh, I'm about I'm pushing myself here. I'm pushing myself into a vulnerable place to talk about. Damn, have I become someone? I don't know. I mean, like the whole like class thing, like like someone who would have uh, very much seen like where I grew up and what I've come from, someone who's like gone from very working class kind of upbringing and now it's like, um, you know, f first person around in the country, in, around my family, like to go, to go all the way through university mm -hmm. and I write books and stuff and this is something only middle class people do and this is like, this is, it's, yeah. Even for myself, I'm trying to, figure out how to articulate that because class is not just about money it's about culture mm -hmm. so you know i can't deny that i'm culturally middle class <laughs> in your in your work i i read a lot and i especially heard a lot of spoken word aspects and as i said in my introduction you also did a master's degree in spoken word how do you relate to that genre, that those developments? Um, I feel like spoken word is constantly becoming more mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Amanda Gorman, the poet who performed during yeah. the inauguration of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris had a big role in that. But also here in the Netherlands, uh, on the 4th of May, our Remembrance Day, a spoken word poet performed in Amsterdam and on oh, national beautiful. TV. So I feel like it's becoming something that many more people know like that compared to in the past how do you relate to spoken word yeah i've, I've been doing sp like poetry spoken word performance like since i was 19 so it's so funny i i spoken word does this because it's like yeah. it has moments it has like cultural moments and then just disappears it's like so like it's yeah i've i've Poetry, uh, spoken word is the new rock and roll. Like uh, I've, heard, I've seen that as a headline like once every five years. <laughs> is spoken word a new rock and roll? Oh God, that's terrible. But um, this is something, by the way, that our queen of spoken word, uh, spoken word in the Netherlands always says, Bob Schons. Oh, like, really? How often does spoken word have to be reinvented? Yes. yes. Yeah, that's great. That's well put. <laughs> it's funny because I actually was most inspired by spoken word when I had opportunities to travel as a spoken word poet. So in my early 20s, I started like, competing in slams. And 
I started going to Germany because mm. I was told that's where the biggest, big there, yeah. biggest um, poetry uh, slams in the world. Not like not just yeah, no, it's huge Europe there. in the world mm. is Germany, and this was ten years ago. Yeah. So I going there, and I, and I was welcomed into this m mainly German speaking scene as a non German speaker. And it was the first time I went to a went to a slam and saw like it was a slam final and there were twelve thousand people at it. Oh my god! And I was just like, oh my god! Like th that whole rock and roll thing. Like I'm not even rolling my eyes at it anymore. <laughs> like this is that's I've never seen anything like that. Um, but then speaking with the poets there, they. they yeah, I can reveal this. It's okay. It was a while ago. They, they just said like, well, maybe it's because comedy. It's a, Germany is a one place where comedy isn't that big. Mm. And stand-up seems to be big in a lot of other places. And the German, no, their words, not mine, the German sensibility for comedy tends to need more satire. It, and, and poetry is great for satire. Again, because... In, in satire and in poems, more than one thing can be true. Mm -hmm. You need some awareness of something that's true and you need some something to hit against it. So, you know, that can be very um, intellectual and I think that can be very cathartic as well for a country that has a history like Germany. So it's, uh, you know, uh, that's that's interesting to me because that's like you unique. Um, but then I did, I did the whole kind of European circuit. I went to Sweden, um, Norway. And it's, it's funny, I never got to Holland, but I did meet a few um, Dutch um, performance poets who came when I was um, curating Keith's house. Dan, he was from Amsterdam and he was brilliant. And again, this is a long time ago. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have, I will always have a reverence, a love, an appreciation um, for spoken word, uh, because that will, again, always be part of the country I'm from, in a sense. Yeah. Um, but honestly, I was also raised talking about like two different camps, and you know, some people would say there's a spoken word, kind of scene mm -hmm. and then a literature scene. They, I don't believe in the divide of the two. So, so again, when I talk about my education and I told you about William Blake, who's seen as this kind of great prophet, poet, um, you know, no recordings of him exist and he only exists on the page. Um, and the way he was delivered to me was on the page. And then my dad, having, knowing these great Jamaican poets he was able to put on tape, uh, like those two experiences I had with both of my parents were equally powerful. So for me, it's, it, it, it wouldn't, I, I would be missing something if I only had half of that mm -hmm. or just one of that. So I hope that like, the spoken word and the literature scenes can connect because one of the things that, that divides them is infrastructure. There isn't as well funded opportunities for spoken word artists and for people to develop as performers of their work than there is for like people who want to develop their writing skills, you know, MFA programs mm -hmm. and university degrees. My title, um, I, my uh, going to university do, to do um, this spoken word education MA is a little bit misleading because 90% of what I learned was about uh, emotional literacy. I learned about how to apply emotional literacy to your lessons, to your classrooms, how to create democracy in a classroom, how to model all of these kind of what you might call uh, some people might call them disruptive uh, ways of learning and countering ideas in the system about how teachers are trained. 
you know, we learned about that. We weren't, we, they weren't teaching us how to be performers because we were already performers. We were already spoken word poets. We were already writers. It was just like, how do we take everything you know and apply it to the classroom to bring about social change? Because we believe that real grounded social change can happen and often does happen in the classroom. It be, can begin there. So it's just like a way to kind of get in at a root level to young minds and within a, an education system which is broken, largely. I, I, I don't know what the state is here, but I'm talking about the UK mm -hmm. um, and, and the US, where I've spent a lot of time teaching as well. So, yeah. In that sense, I find it so interesting how you position yourself in relation in relation to other poets and older poets who we might be teaching our young people about in schools, uh, William Blake, but also Ted Hughes. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the most interesting two pages, just visually, and you know what I'm talking about in this book, is um, let me just show the camera and. You can also see my notes, but it's, uh, I'm talking about the poem itself. So it's it's the poem Deaf School mm. by Ted Hughes, which you included in your book, mm. but you blacked the poem out. Mm. Um, so we can't read it. Obviously, I started Googling it because I did want <laughs> to read it. Um, and then the poem after that is called After Reading Deaf School by the Mississippi River. Mm. Um, how, did, how did this come to be? How did you make this decision and why this poem by Ted Hughes from 1979? Yeah, so, yeah, a lot to unpack there. Um, do people know who Ted Hughes is here? Just curious. I presume people do know. Mostly, maybe. Like, so Ted Hughes is one of the most esteemed English poets of all time. Um, and I did have a relationship with him. He read a, he, he wrote children's books as well. I really liked his children's book. Um, he had one called The Iron Man, which I thought was brilliant. I've been had a sequel, The Iron Woman. Um, so I and also Ted Hughes' first collection, Hawk in the Rain, um, was one of the first collections I ever read. First poem to last poem. I didn't understand almost anything, but I felt something. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is oh, oh interest like. Mm. Um, so I'm just saying this to say that I do have, again, a reverence for Ted Hughes. So when I came across this poem called Death School, in which he talks, uh, I should give a context. So in the late 70s, Ted Hughes was commissioned to um, by the National Theatre in the UK to go and find out how people live without language. That was the brief. How do people live without language? And Ted Hughes took it upon himself to go into a deaf school um, in London, sit down and just observe uh, deaf children being taught by a teacher of the deaf. And he writes this poem as a kind of fly on the wall in which he uses words like, um, you know, simple, um, it's in the poem. Um, uh, unaware, simple pool, lacking a dimension, removed from the vibration of air, alert, simple, subtle, waving aura of sound and responses to sound. So all of these kind of, um, again, very typical of Ted Hughes, like kind of nature-based um, imagery, metaphor, um, to personify someone. But when it comes to Ted Hughes in this classroom, and there's even a line where he compares these deaf children to monkeys. It's so, yeah, it's an assault. It's a violent, mm. visceral assault on a community and a way of being. Um, and so what I decided to do, because I, I pondered this for so long, I was like, oh, I can't, how, how has this not been revised yeah. already? 
So I initially put the poem in in the in the book so you could see it, and yeah, um, then that version. but then you, I, I was threatened with a lawsuit <laughs> by oh, the really? Tech estate. So they said if you we, we do not give you permission to print this, blah blah blah. So I said, okay, don't worry, I won't print it. But then I did print it. I just redacted it, and then uh, and then I used some of the language from the poem to write the next poem that's in the book. Um, and also just to say, talking about school and learning, I know we've got to wrap up, but like um, one of the most powerful experiences I ever had going into, into, a, school, into a classroom with this was um, showing this to a deaf student who saw this on the page and said, mm. turn it that way. And, he, and I did that and he said, that, that looks like the audio channels. It looks like when my um, uh, audiologist is putting in cochlear implants and you can see the sound waves on his screen. And I thought, what a beautiful is. example of what can happen when you transcend yeah. your own kind of anger and create something which then can be modeled for different ways of thinking about the things that hurt us. So, Raymond you... Antrobus, thank you so yes, much you. for this lovely conversation and your great performances. Please, everyone, I just recommend Google him, go to his website, watch his videos, read his work. It's amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. So a thank you on behalf of me as well. Um, if you can't get enough of Raymond, he will be uh, joining us later this evening. Um, stay tuned. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>